string amplitudes at one loop. It's clear why we should be interested in loop amplitudes in field theory. Weinberg in his quantum field theory book emphasizes that these authors taught us how to compute loop amplitudes in yang mills theory as a warming up exercise to compute graviton scattering amplitudes. So this gives one example that computing graviton amplitudes seem to have no application, for example in collider physics, was directly relevant for particle physics. I brought this up in the string intro video. Bryce Witt assigned four-point tree-level graviton scattering to his student who got this cross-section. It's very simple and it's interesting for a modern reader to try to dig this out in the current literature. I gave some entry points later, but this is at tree level. So the four graviton one loop amplitude was computed in this paper in 94. And of course this calculation is very difficult, but they use string-based methods. As Bryce DeWitt emphasizes in this paper, even if you were only interested in field theory, string amplitude calculations provide a different view of things that we know are important, such as Yang-Mills theory. So for my calculations, we'll use a very special one plus one dimensional theory, conformal field theory. If you need to brush up, take a look at one of the earlier videos. So to set the stage, scattering amplitudes, think of as series expansions, not necessarily convergent. In field theory, you have diagrams like this or others at tree level, for example, for four gravitons or four gauge bosons, and there'll be loop corrections, possibly involving couplings to other particles or external particles themselves. You have one loop corrections and two loop corrections that are suppressed in H bar, here depicted chiseled into a wall at, at the Simon Center. In string theory, this is viewed as a low energy expansion for energy is much below the string scale, where at the string scale, this would be the calculation. So as discussed in earlier videos, we view the external states as insertions on a world sheet with, for example, a sphere topology, a torus topology, double torus topology, or other slight variations. For example, if these were gauge bosons, a one loop amplitude could be, for example, a cylinder world sheet, which can be found by involution from a torus. So you pick a torus, so this would be a two-point function, but you can also view it as just a part of a four-point function. So the concrete calculation we'll be doing is to think intrinsically on this torus. From the point of view of the torus itself, something magically appears here, propagates on the torus, and originally we'd be solving a wave equation with a disturbance here, but in practice it would often be an analytic continuation of that. So in any case, there's some disturbance here that propagates to here, and then magically disappears because it corresponds to an out state. Of course, the torus having two cycles correspond to these sides being identified in pairs. So what I'm really computing are correlation functions, a world sheet scale that's a world sheet fermions, and this connected to the external states, the combinations of these fundamental states in terms of composite vertex operators. If you arrange this calculation correctly, this is just one propagator or Green's function, and in many cases this vanishes. So we would need to go to the next one. It has two propagators or two Green's functions in X space. And by the way, in flat space times, you don't really have a three vertex in this sense. And now to some extent this can be simulated by inserting graviton vertex operators and treating them like a background. This is kind of a particle physics point of view, which is criticized by Penrose in, for example, this article from 1980, where he specifically attacks Weinberg's approach to gravity in Weinberg's book Gravitation and Cosmology. So for now, let's focus on flat space time, where a gravitational background would at most be represented by graviton vertex operators. To connect this picture to field theory, we can take a skinny limit, where one cycle of torus shrinks, then it looks more like a coupling correction in quantum field theory. So pictorially, you should really think of this loop as being this loop here for gravitons or similarly for gauge bosons with the cylinder loop. So you really get diagrams or at least some of Feynman diagrams directly reproduced from these string calculations. Let's talk a little more about this torus. This Z variable is good because it connects to the sphere coordinate used at tree level, but I will use Z to mean something else. I'll just mean this W divided by two pi. So in that Z variable, the periodicities are Z and one and Z and tau. Now it's sometimes useful to undo these identifications and similarly in the tau direction. This view of the torus with these infinite copies, then I can allow a phase, so it's not quite periodic, but it's quasi-periodic. It just has this phase where the V is real and similarly in the tau direction. By the way, if you don't care about orbit folds, you may know this from particles in magnetic fields. This is a standard problem in condensed matter physics. The phase you get has to do with the magnetic field gauge potential. But here, for me, it's going to be an orbifold. That has to do with breaking supersymmetry and allowing the ambient space-time to be only almost everywhere flat. Recall that tree level, the whole computation was reduced to some constant that wasn't so important, and then these Green's functions of vertex positions. Let me contrast this with the one-loop calculation. Let me first ignore ghosts, as Polchinski does in this section, and in a moment I'll put them back. So this just means on the torus, parameterized by this complex structure tau, what you're actually doing is computing a trace of time translations in the tau2 direction, imaginary time, with the momentum operator you allow for a twist along 
one of those torus cycles, and this can be repackaged in terms of the Q. Well, L0 is a various order generator that is related to the Hamiltonian. This is just a conformability way to rewrite this expression. And this is computed pretty explicitly in Polchinski's book or in other similar books. In his book, there are two ways, first by operators, the sort of the standard way, and there's a neat conformability way to compute it by holomorphy. Get this expression for the partition function of D scalar bosons on the torus, where this is the Dedekind eta function defined like this. This 1800s mathematics, you already had the 24 transverse oscillators of the bosonic string. In Polchinski, the functional integral calculation of this by functional determinant is left as an exercise, and I'll discuss this a little bit in this video. More generally, you would need to have ghosts, and you may have more vertex operators. Here, just put the trivial vertex operator. So at one loop, as discussed in the ghost video, there's one ghost insertion for a world sheet metric modulus, which is B here, and there's a C ghost for fixing the position W1, and then we integrate over the remaining vertex operators. Then we integrate the metric modulus over the fundamental domain in the upper half plane. And this is the general one-loop S matrix on the torus. So if we want to compute this, we need to do conformal theory contractions. Just like in our familiar example of exponential contractions on the sphere, we're going to need the Green's function. Because remember, here we tend to compute in X space. In quantum field theory, we often compute in P space, where you write the propagator. So what is the Green's function on the torus? This is the Laplace operator on the torus, where W is the original variable that was periodic from 0 to 2 pi in Bolchinsky. Now, we're used to having a delta function on the right-hand side when we compute a Green's function. This term is unfamiliar to many. To see why it needs to be there, integrate the left-hand side over the torus, which is compact. So using standard theorems, this integral vanishes. So roughly speaking, ignoring the factors of pi and 2, the delta function here gives minus 1, and the integral over a constant gives the area of the torus, which is roughly speaking tau 2. So then you basically have minus 1 and plus 1, and that gives you 0. So that's how this can have a solution, meaning if you didn't put this term there is no solution if you're considering functions on the actual torus. Now I'll use z is w over 2 pi, so the period is 0 to 1. Pochinsky's argument, why we should have the Jacobi theta function, which he defines in chapter 7.3, in this Green's function, is that theta 1 goes to 0 for z goes to 0. So this reduces to minus log z absolute value squared, which is the Green's function on the sphere. As you can check that the combination of these two terms is actually doubly periodic, meaning if you go in z goes to z plus 1 or z goes to z plus tau, you're actually invariant. Now, what is this function of tau here? Being a Green's function of the torus doesn't determine this extra function here because it's simply annihilated by the Laplacian. One explicit realization is as a kronecker eichstein series that we'll define in a second, plus some function of tau where this is data can eta that we had already in the zero point function. The kronecker eichstein series or kronecker eichstein function is discussed in these math references, for example, Carl Sieg's title lectures or Henri Veil's book. I use two different normalizations for this object. Sometimes I might use blackboard bold to emphasize the distinction, but they only differ by this factor, which is 1 for s equals 1. Let's put w equals 0 to orient ourselves. Then Kronecker's second limit formula says that this expression is actually equal to this, which what we just had with a slightly different choice of this function. So this is the combination favored by these mathematicians. So what is the double sum? Well, if you did exercise 7.3 in Polchinski is to show that if you take this expression that we've essentially found by guessing a solution to this equation, Fourier expanding, again for w equals zero now initially, these are just plane waves. So what we're doing is a Fourier expansion in plane waves on the surface of the torus. And then m plus n tau squared for s equals one is just the inverse of the Laplacian using these basis Fourier waves. So as I already mentioned, this problem was effectively solved by Kronecker in the 1800s. One way to express the second limit formula in modern terms is in this way, that e to the minus e0 prime, where prime is with respect to s, this s. Another way to express it is like this. To make this concrete, I plot the left and right hand sides using just two terms, and using 20 terms. And the theta function representation converges quickly, the double sum representation converges slowly, but in mathematics it takes basically no time to put 20 terms, and then both representations are fine. So 1800s mathematicians tended to prefer theta function representations because they converge more quickly, but the double sum has very nice properties for computation, as we'll see. But before I get into a sample calculation, let me point out that Polchinski differentiates between a renormalized self-contraction Green's function. You add this term, so the limit is finite. And if you look in Polchinski 7.3, this is proportional to dedicate eta cubed. And when they have this extra z independent term or not, it's precisely the difference between this representation favored by mathematicians and this extra term that makes it be eta cubed here, as we had here. So with this understanding, you can now look at Prochinsky exercise 7.1. We're trying to compute the CFT expectation value on the torus, 
analogously to the sphere calculation, and you see that the transformation properties under the S transformation, this expectation value is invariant if you have massless external states. And all the Kronika's second limit form can be thought of as the computation of the fermion partition function. It can also be used to recreate this expression for the bosonic partition function. And assembling that, we get this for a fermion, possibly with non-trivial quasi-periodicity. We get this for a twisted boson, which is written in Polchinski volume 2. And the total, you multiply them together, this eta cancels. And this is a partition function for a twisted fermion and a twisted boson. And now you have these building blocks. You can compute, for example, the zero-point annulus amplitude. We discussed this in bosonic string in volume 1, and then for the superstring in chapter 10 in volume 2. In superstring in 10 dimensions, there are 10 coordinates, and contributions from ghosts cancel two of them. So there are eight fermions, for example. You can put in four complex pairs, and that's why you have this power of four here. In 10 dimensions, the quasi periodicities are at most plus or minus one. There are four combinations 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and here are two of them. L here is the S transform of T. Where here t was a major part of tau. You can get the free theory limit of these amplitudes by considering the leading term in t and you get this, which with the original constant gives you another constant times the Green's function of the transverse directions to the extended object on which these open strings are attached, the d brain. So here g is the Green's function of the Laplacian, which is the power for d greater than 2. Once you're familiar with these kind of expressions, without getting stuck on details, it's a good exercise to just plug this in here and try to take this limit and see these field theory amplitudes emerge. So going backwards here, we can think of this as an integral representation of this Green's function. More generally, we can think of this physically as some kind of potential between these two d brains that correspond to the boundaries of the cylinder. And more generally, instead of theta functions, we'll have some automorphic forms. This kind of computation is closely related to the heat kernel method. In fact, the theta function is the original heat kernel, meaning the Green's function of the heat equation. It's actually introduced as such by people long before Jacobi trying to solve the heat equation. In fact, Fourier introduced Fourier analysis for that purpose. You may also want to go back to quantum mechanics and look at the propagator in lippmann schrodinger equation also arises in a way closely related to these kind of calculations. Some of these string diagrams have tentpole divergences that have important physical interpretations. For this, I refer to either the book by Banis and Ranga or our paper Appendix N. But the video is almost over, and we didn't see a lot of application yet of this beautiful formula for the one loop S matrix of n external states. Here's one possible entry point. Look at this seminal Dunbar Norwich paper for the four graviton one loop amplitude. So none of these separations of field theory and string theory are really true separations. There's a lot of contact. This paper by Yuan Sinochirov contains a beautiful modern recalculation of these kind of calculations in gravity using the BCJ double copy that writes gravity amplitudes in terms of Yang Mills theory which in my mind is very much in the spirit of this older work of really seeing the connections between these two even more directly than was possible at the time. And then, of course, I can't help mention one of my own papers with Buchberger and Schlotterer, where we first have a string paper where we compute three and four-point amplitudes at one loop, and then a field theory paper where we connect to this field theory paper, which in turn connects to the graviton one loop four-point calculation. Some of the modern field theory methods are beautifully explained in Alex Edison's PhD thesis, and these two prolific authors have a beautiful sequence of papers on a new perspective on how to compute these one-loop string amplitudes. Of course, as you watch this video, there will have been even more wonderful new papers out. These are just a few entry points into this huge literature. So let me finish by one explicit calculation using some of the objects we developed here. So let's focus on this world sheet Feynman diagram with one Green's function here and one Green's function here. I can draw it like this. First I go from 0 to z, and I go back from z to 0. So I get the difference in the argument of the Green's function, so I get this. But I hope you see the connection with this object. If you put w equals 0 and expand this, you have these Fourier plane waves that in these real variables just look like this. So the periodicities here are x goes to x plus 1 and y goes to y plus 1. We integrate over the torus because the argument is minus over here compared to what is here. Then we combine them and use this elementary identity that this integrates to 0 unless the summation variables are the same. This collapses the two double sums I have here to a single double sum and then it's proportional to the second non-holomorphic Eisenstein series. This is the simplest example of a modular graph function. They introduced, for example, in the book by Flag et al. Two quick remarks before I close this video. Recall that this is not an absolutely convergent double sum. We couldn't include the twist, this w, so the orbifold amplitudes are generally better behaved than the non-orbifold amplitudes in this sense, though only marginally so with the twist. If you put a mass as a regulator, we discussed in this paper, then you get Bessel functions here that make it exponentially convergent. Just like in quantum field theory, often we don't need that, but sometimes it could be useful. My final remark is that in this literature, it's observed that 
This E2 is an eigenfunction of the upper half plane Laplacian. The original Green's function was the Green's function of the Laplacian in Z. Laplacian in tau seems like a more abstract concept from this point of view, and you may be familiar with it from ads -EFT, where you also look at eigenfunctions or Green's functions on the upper half plane rather than on the torus itself. Why this should satisfy an, an equation like this? So there are examples where supersymmetry enforces this kind of relation, so perhaps world sheet supersymmetry could help us organize these objects in the world sheet Feynman diagrams. But as I record this video, modular graph functions and modular graph forms and related objects are really only at the beginning of being explored. I think there's a lot more to be learned about this and how to be efficient about the perturbation theory and the quantum field theory on the world sheet and provide yet another point of view on the relation between the space-time point of view and the world sheet point of view.